Good evening, one and all, and welcome. We're delighted to have you here this evening. My name is Father Jim Lees. I'm a priest of the Congregation of Holy Cross, the founding community, Catholic religious community of Notre Dame, and the, the group that continues to animate it uh, in all ways. Um, I'm in my sixth year here at the uh, Notre Dame London Global Gateway. I serve as the um, Senior Director, I always have to look up my own title, it's very long, Senior Director for Academic Initiatives and Outreach, or Partnerships. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this 13th Annual Notre Dame London Shakespeare Lecture in honor of Professor Sir Stanley Wells, who's here with us tonight. At the University of Notre Dame, we understand that in order to be an international research university, we must work constantly to expand our global presence, sending our students and scholars and administrators out into the world to study and to learn, to do research, and to gain valuable work experience. Notre Dame has, a continuous, has had a continuous presence in London since 1968. I was six years old, I'm happy to report. And our presence here has developed into the largest of Notre Dame's 12 international gateways and centers throughout the world. London is an important location, I don't need to tell most of you, for many reasons, not least because of the unrivaled cultural opportunities and the unparalleled artistic community in this city. The cultural rich richness allows our students to immerse themselves essentially using London as a classroom. Tonight, for example, we're able to learn about Shakespeare, just a stone's throw away from where he himself said his own plays. And we're able to enjoy the Globe Theater and the other remarkable halls in the UK where Shakespeare continually is reimagined. In addition to this, the university's presence in the UK allows us to form partnerships and preeminent among them is the St. Edmunds College in Cambridge. Um, which is well represented here tonight with the presence of their master, Catherine Arnold, and the director of the Von Hugel Institute for Critical Catholic Inquiry, um, Vittorio Montemaggi. We're delighted to have them here and as well their guests. This partnership and others encourages and supports collaboration between the respective faculties, scholars, and students. A pertinent example of our joint efforts is a collaborative initiative between the Von Hugel Institute, Shakespeare at Notre Dame, and the London Global Gateway, exploring Shakespeare and the common good. With that, I want to acknowledge the presence of Scott Jackson from the Notre Dame faculty on the main campus, who is here with us tonight. The prospect and projects that we hope to convene here among scholars and students and practitioners explore how Shakespeare both succeeds and fails to galvanize shared pursuits of the common good and seeks to increase engagement with Shakespeare as a resource for building communities that bring together even more diverse arrays of, of voices and perspectives. Tonight's event, the Notre Dame London Shakespeare Lecture, was initially conceived of by our longtime and much esteemed faculty colleague, Boyka Sokolova, who is here tonight, I need not say, with her dear husband, Elliot. Um, and with the collaboration uh, with the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust and the Shakespeare Institute, whose rep representatives we welcome tonight as well, and to whom we bear a deep debt of gratitude for their continuing partnership. The university is a Catholic university and a place of teaching and scholarship and research, but it is equally a, a place that values community and service in creating a space where top academics, renowned practitioners, and the community can come together to engage and share ideas. The Notre Dame Shakespeare Lecture is a true embodiment of all that we hope to achieve as a university. For her tireless work on this project for 13 long years, allow me to thank again Boyka and to welcome her to introduce our honored guests. Thank you. <laughs> So welcome from me to the 13th Notre Dame Shakespeare Lecture in honor of Professor Sir Stanley Wells. A special welcome once again to Stanley. Tonight, uh, apart from the people present in this room, we are joined virtually by several dozen Shakespearean, Shakespearean scholars and theater practitioners from uh, the UA. US and from across Europe. Uh, audience uh, extends from Portugal to Poland, Italy, Bulgaria, Hungary, and Romania. With 
great pleasure. We welcome several Ukrainian colleagues who have managed or perhaps will manage to join us online. And those who don't have electricity tonight will probably be able to watch the lecture online when it is posted on our website. When 13 years ago this lecture started, it was a purely academic gesture to honor a major Shakespeare scholar. We could not have foreseen that it would become to use Jan Kott's metaphor for Hamlet, a sponge that soaks up the pressure of the time in the way that the play did under totalitarian regimes. But here we are. An independent European country has been brutally invaded by an imperial power. And last year, we uh, used this forum to call for support for our Ukrainian Shakespeare colleagues. For a whole year now, they have been living and working in unimaginable circumstances. Between teaching and surviving the horrors of destruction, they have put themselves on a war footing and shown incredible resilience and courage. After their dispersal to different cities by the fortunes of war, the members of the Shakespeare Center in Zaporizhia have thrown themselves into volunteering while continuing to teach online and wherever possible in person. Let me read you uh, a couple of recent volunteer reports from one of the transformations of the Shakespeare Center, the Shakespeare Volunteer Group in Ternopil. Volunteer report, January the 20th, 2023. Volunteer Group Shakespeare, together with the doctors of the frontline Vishde Tarkovsky has a hospital who daily have to deal with the manifestations and consequences of brotherly love, thank Ternopil volunteers for providing humanitarian assistance and a huge charge of positivity and optimism. Many thanks for the quick and free delivery of much needed medicines. Volunteer report, February the 3rd, 2023. Fighters who defend the Zaporizhia region send a big thank you to the Ternopil volunteers for delicious dumplings, uh, trench candles, food kits, and other uplifting goodies, and for super comfy trench beds and lighters. So today we begin our Shakespeare lecture with a call for support. At the back of the room on that table there, uh, there is a collection box and you must have received by now an email with bank accounts to which you can contribute. We are looking at small sums, but just don't forget them. They need all the support they uh, can get. And now, allow me to introduce our guests. Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming two distinguished guests. Simon Russell Beale, one of the greatest British actors of our time, and Professor Carol Chillington Rutter of the University of Warwick, one of our most significant Shakespeare theatre and performance scholars. <clears throat> Where does one start when trying to present Simon Russell Beale, the actor, the accomplished musician, the man with a deep academic mind, the broadcaster who has given us wonderful insights in the history of music, the voice from the radio that makes you stop in your tracks to listen to poetry? The range and versatility of Beale's talent have enabled him to inhabit all media and all forms of theater, from high tragedy to farce, to musicals, to all kinds of modern and classical plays, television, film, and radio. I shouldn't forget to mention that Simon has also appeared in ballet, a choice described by critics as genius casting. His repertory is vast, and here I have time to say only a few words about his Shakespeare parts. 
Professor Wells notes that Beale is an actor who defies classification and who has won success in a wider range of Shakespearean roles than perhaps any actor since Richard Burbage himself. Beale's acting career started at the age of eight as a chorister at St. Paul's Cathedral, continued through his education at Clifton College, Bristol, and his years in Cambridge, where he received a first degree, uh, a first class degree in English, and his, through his studies at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. All these have contributed to his astute understanding of the complex textures of language visible in his acting and now in his academic work as editor of the Shakespeare Arden Performance Series. So here is uh, King Lear, uh, edited by uh, the, an Arden Performance Edition, edited by uh, Simon and by Abigail Rockison Woodall. And uh, if you're interested, you can grab a copy again at the back after, uh, after we uh, finish. Simon Beale has traveled through the different ages of the actor, creating a range of unforgettable characters, from the second shepherd to Leontes, from Edgar to Lear, from Ariel to Prospero, Thersites, Cassius, Richard III, Richard II, Iago, Hamlet, Macbeth, Falstaff, Timon, Malvolio, Benedict. He is the recipient of numerous awards and recognitions, among them several BAFTAs and Olivier's, and his latest award is a Tony, which he got for his performance in the Lehman Trilogy. He has a CBE, and in 2019, he was knighted by Queen Elizabeth II. As his audience, we all have our own unforgettable memories of his characters. A lot has been written about his capacity to create something new, unseen before, about the way he mints the language, savors the word, slowly releases the richness of a theatrical situation. I relish the double vision I experience when he first appears on the stage, you look at a familiar figure that is at the same time totally someone else, a character that emerges in tiny gestures in the exquisitely slow deliberateness of the phrasing. Several of the several people in this room have written about Beale's actorly revelations. I'd like to share just a couple of mine. Macbeth, watching the death throes of Lady Macduff with the fascination of a sadistic teenager and the completely new way he played that final enough. His Lear has taught me to be much kinder to the character. While his Benedict emerging from a pool of water with, love me, why? I could have fallen in love with myself. But if I'm to use my own metaphor for the experience of watching Beale on stage, I would liken it to that of observing a ball light, uh, lightning slowly waft through space. These forms of nature are slow, magnetic, unpredictable, intense, dangerous, and mesmerizing. As you watch the character he has performed dissipate into the curtain calls and the actor emerge underneath it, you feel that you have been present at a theatrical phenomenon. It is only opposite that an actor of Bill's caliber should be in, the, in conversation with Professor Rutter. Carol's books on performance are a gold standard in the field. She's a dedicated teacher who has helped form a new generation of Shakespeare scholars. She has worked tirelessly to introduce innovative methods of teaching and her writing 
is deeply research-based. Last year, she treated us to some of her groundbreaking research into the Venetian life of Sir Henry Wooten, Queen Elizabeth I's ambassador to the Serenissima. This time, she appears here wearing her other hat of theatre historian. And we look forward to an exciting evening. Please welcome our guest. Um, that was mildly embarrassing. Yes, yes I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you very much. We can go home now, Simon. Yes. Um, you're going to be seeing a series of slides. I put these together, not in chronological sequence, but somehow also in, in thematic um, uh, order. Um, and uh, I uh, give you the first slide. Uh, this was the first time I saw Simon Russell Beale on stage at the RSC. He was playing a character in the Fair Maid of the West called Fawcett, the book holder. And I cherish this image of Simon because there he is as little Fawcett, staring at the words, looking at the book. And later on, um, Simon uh, was talking to me about playing Shakespeare. And just in the middle of talking about something, he says, there's something in the writing. With Shakespeare, there's always something in the writing, which has more or less been now the kind of lodestone for how I read Shakespeare, to find that something in the writing that I can bring to uh, students' attentions as they think about what's in the writing. So this is all going to be me just playing stooge to Simon, talking about what's in the writing. Um, and I wanted though to ask my first question, um, drawing on um, a reflection, a question, how, given that we can kind of agree that you've had a moderately successful career, how did you manage to salvage that out of complete failure? You weren't supposed to be an actor. No, I wasn't. No. Before I answer that, can I say something about Fawcett? Because Fawcett was an entirely created role. Uh, it was two plays stuck together by Haywood. I think mm -hmm. I'm right. Yep. Think, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, which Trevor Nunn directed and he sort of mashed it together. It was one of those sort of um, Elizabethan swashbuckling uh, adventure stories centered around a, a woman called Bess. Needless to say, um, and I was and Trevor created this role for me. I mean, it was literally tiny, and it didn't mean anything, but he created it for me as this sort of stage manager, very shy stage manager. And I remember that it, was, it opened the Swan Theatre in Stratford. Uh, it was the opening show which uh, the Queen came to, the late Queen, and um, Bess, played by Imelda Staunton, had every night. A, a long speech that I suspect is a sort of Elizabethan trope uh, in praise of Queen Bess. Uh, and uh, at the end of that speech, every night, I was so moved as a character by this paean that I used to mutter, God save the Queen, <laughs> um, uh, after she finished, <laughs> laugh from the audience. And I said to Trevor, look, um, <laughs> You've got the real queen in uh, tonight. Do you think, because we don't want to laugh there, do we? Uh, it's like, cut it. And he said, no, no, keep it in. And uh, I got to the, she, she got to the end of the speech, and I went, God save the queen. And instead of a laugh, everyone went, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is quite and I thought, that's about what that speech probably was originally. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, oh, anyway, so I wasn't supposed to do it. I didn't, I didn't come from a particularly literary family. I came from a very musical family. As you say, I, I, was, I was trained as a choir boy. Uh, I, I was what's called a choral scholar at Cambridge University, which meant I had to sing every day. And I went, like a lot of choral school, scholars do from Oxford and Cambridge, uh, to a London music college. And it was only there that I went, hang on a minute, I had... Well, firstly, I'm not a good enough singer. That was the that was a big thing, and I didn't enjoy singing actually in an odd way. My father will kill me for saying that, but I I, I didn't really enjoy it, and I knew that something had been building up, especially about Shakespeare, since I was twelve, and uh, I knew that I probably had to go into that area. And I remember I phoned my parents up and I said, "I'm so sorry, Mum, Dad, 
I think I want to try and be an actor. And she, they said, oh, thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> we knew that's what you were going to do. So it was a sort of, it was a sort of the last, the last move of a very confusing couple of years. In so that life. same year then, in 1986, when you joined the RSC, you also played this young shepherd yeah. uh, in Winter's Tale, and you were directed by uh, Terry Hans. Um, I remember this, um, this, this, this event on stage of this young shepherd coming on to tell of this disaster story of the bear eating Antigonus yeah. uh, and it being absolutely hilarious yeah. uh, because you were doing this and then you were doing that and you were doing this and you were doing that. Um, and uh, uh, the expressiveness of the eyes in all of this was a revelation. I was wearing quite a lot of mascara, wasn't I, in, in, in that picture? Um, uh, yeah, my first ever professional Shakespeare, directed by the great and underrated Terry Hans. Actually, he he died a few years ago, um, and he ran the Royal Shakespeare Company for years and put a lot of people together. Mm -hmm. He was one of those directors who famously in Liverpool and then in Stratford sort of enjoyed putting people together. And in fact, he was responsible for putting me with Sam Mendes, with whom I've done many, many shows over the years. He was the one who said to Sam, I think you should look at that actor there. Um, and various things about, firstly, this was, I, I later did Winter's Tale. So it's one of the few plays I've done twice. And The Shepherd was very interesting because, as you can see in the quote at the bottom, Terry Han said, young shepherds, he said to me, young shepherds go on to play Hamlet. And um, it was a, a, an odd thing to say because at that stage, I think I was seen principally, and I saw myself principally as a a comic actor, a grotesque actor, comic actor, whatever. Um, and I think they used to have sort of boxes at the RSC, the casting department, and you, and you were literally in a column, leading actor, young leading actor, comic actor, clown. Um, and so I assumed that's what I'd be doing all the time. And I just remember him saying that and thinking, and there's a a very famous picture of Paul Schofield playing the young shepherd. There's a portrait of Paul Schofield playing the young shepherd uh, in in Stratford. Um, he must have been astonishing to have a portrait being painted of playing the young shepherd. I mean, that's, I mean, it must be magnificent. But obviously, <laughs> some somebody. Uh, yes, there was a man who then went on to. He did do Hamlet, didn't he? Yes, and uh, famously did Lear, of course. So he went on to do all the, the big parts as well. So it was something that just clocked in my head. Um, and I think, as I say, I think Terry was just going, regard this as an investment. But it was a bit more than that. I mean, I think what was fascinating about, that was my first clown. Um, and over the next five years, I did a series of restoration fops. I did a series of clowns. And they're all slightly different. And the, the thing that that taught me was that clown is not Autolycus. It's not the part that presumably Shakespeare's leading clown played, Robert Armin. It was presumably another actor who played this part, which of course is not called the clown in the play, no. in, mm -hmm. the, in the early scripts. Uh, he's called the young shepherd. Am I right? Mm -hmm. uh, young shepherd. Um, and so don't, don't, box, don't box these characters in, Simon. I said to myself, don't box them in because... Because that's, um, you know, don't see yourself as a clown. Don't see yourself as a comic actor. See yourself as the young shepherd. It's quite, it's quite an interesting um, uh, idea to take forward when you have to play parts like Malvolio, which we'll come to, and um, Thersites and whatever, whatever, those comic terms. Uh, because this, this young guy is not like them. He was... Um, gorgeous and simple and good. And uh, uh, there was quite a lesson in not boxing people characters in. Well, as I understand it, that, that trajectory that you appeared to be on of being typecast as the clown brought you to a point where you had a phone call from the young Sam Mendes <laughs> to whom Terry Hans had directed him to you. Uh, and he invited you to play this part Oh, and as uh, I understand it, you your heart sank. Yes, I was, staying, I was staying with my parents. In uh, uh, dad was an army officer, a doctor. We were staying in a rather grim quarters in the middle of the Salisbury Plain. Um, 
which though of you, those of you who know the sorcery plane will know how, how grim that can be. It was a big, ugly house uh, where he was posted. And mum came into the living room and said, there's this man called Sam Mendes on the phone for you. And Sam at that stage was sort of, he was already getting to be big. You know, he was, he was the person everyone was talking about. And he, he said, I, I'm doing Joyce Agresta. Uh, my first show at the RSC, and I'd like you to do societies, and my heart sank. I thought, oh, no, God. All that incomprehensible language, trying to make it funny, you know. Uh, uh, forgive me, but the part I've never wanted to play is Touchstone. I've never wanted to play <laughs> And then, um, uh, in fact, years later, when Agent Noble offered me the fool in Lear, uh, uh, I said, I, I can't. I can't, I just can't, I can't, I just can't make it work. Anyway, because he was so famous, or getting to be so famous and so powerful, I thought, well, I've got, I can't turn it down, can I? And I've got to, and it proved to be just a marvel. It was, it was firstly a great production. Um, it was Sam at his most elegantly understated as a production, which was quite a classy thing to do as your first big show at a major theatre company. He didn't show off at all. It was just beautiful. The cast, looking back, was sort of breathtaking. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just, you read the list now, and you think, how on earth did Terry Hans again get those sort of people? Um, uh, and he was genuinely funny. And, uh, I mean, there are, you know, if, if you have a, a line about, another character he's, he's not got so much brain as earwax you're on a winner aren't you i mean it's just you 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 can make that funny and you can make there's a marvelous list of animals that he says as i said i'd rather be a cock a hen a, a puttock or whatever a tick. to be menelaus oh, yes, yes to be a, 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 a tick, tick on a lap a sheep. Yeah, on, a, a, on a leper sheep. on a leper yeah um, um yeah, it's, it's it's genuinely funny, and also, of course, he's. Okay. But can you just do that? To, just the, the the last bit, but to be known. Oh, I can't. No, just I can't the last remember, I can't remember the the line. He says, um, "I would, I would be, I would prepare to be, a dog, a pig, a horse, a cat, a louse on a leper." I think is the last. A tick on a sheet. A tick, a tick on a sheet. But to be Medelay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would, I would, was I would fight against her. I would do something. Yeah, and and an awful dropping of my voice for comic effect. You know? um, but he was genuinely funny, and he was genuinely pained. That's what I found exciting about him because he was a man. He looked appalling. <laughs> he had every communicable disease you can imagine. Um, he loathed being in the employment of Ajax. He loathed being in the employment of Achilles and Patroclus. Uh, he regarded the whole war as incompetently managed, a waste of time. But as I say in that, he so wanted Achilles to be Achilles. You know what I mean? He just looked, Kieran Hines, <laughs> so, yeah. messing around in his tent. He so wanted Achilles to be striding across the plains of Troy as magnificent as he should have been. And the same with Proclus and the same with even with Ajax. You know, he just wanted them to be the best warriors that they could possibly be. And I, I, I've, I that's where his, his disappointment and his cynicism came from. Um, and the other thing, of course, is that he... Like a lot of the characters I seem to have ended up playing, he's not very good at sex or love. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> wars and lechery, the site is, is his summation of the whole play, isn't it? Wars and lechery, nothing else, nothing else holds fashion. The wars I've already talked about. The <laughs> lechery was when I, Bessida uh, at one point dropped, um, she had a scarf and she had her scene a great scene in Troilus and Cresta, which involves three layers of overhearing, two layers of overhearing. So five people on stage, all listening to each other. The only person who hears them all is the sighted. Um, and uh, Cressida betrays Troilus, goes off with another man, 
drops her scarf and, uh, and then Ulysses and tro uh, Troilus leave. Thersites is left by himself and he sniffed. That's another thing I keep on doing. Mm -hmm. Sniffing scenes. He's, <laughs> he's, he sniffed. Um, there's another sniffer later, which is very important. Sniffed uh, the the perfume, the faint memory of perfume on this scar before he said wars and lecture, mm -hmm. nothing else holds fashion. And just that, it's like a different world for him, isn't it? It's a, it's a, it's a world he, he won't know now, mm -hmm. if he ever did. But playing, playing that, that Thersites, you were so disappointed so a romantic yeah. attached to the idea of war, yeah. wearing your C and D badge, I yeah, and that. and this this compilation of um, various um, cultural signifiers made you into a cultural commentator at the same time that you were playing. It was edgy and it was it was uh, dark. Um, but what I also recall of that was that you were a Puritan of the yes. of, of of the Trojan War, like, like lots of satirists are, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, and a moral so, Puritan. Yeah. The um, uh, yes, absolutely. And they, they, what was what's amazing about that play is that finally, of course, Achilles does leave his tent. Uh, Patroclus is killed. Achilles leaves his tent, and he does this. He does a war cry, basically. I mean, he mm -hmm. doesn't he doesn't fight fair, and Hector's killed by however many of Achilles' fellow soldiers, the Myrmidons, and he's just butchered ruthlessly. And so the society's reaction to that as a disappointed moralist or romantic is a sort of horror and delight. So it's a funny mixture, but, um, and in fact, in the in the in the production, I ended up uh, screaming silent, silently, I think, mm -hmm. um, at the back of the stage as Hector was brutally speared by lots of uh, weapons and died. And um, that particular scream used to change every night. This is another interesting thing. That I learned on that show, so it just changed every night in the in the terms of the balance of of the triumph of being um, what's the word not justified uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for in vindicated. Thank you. The the triumph of being vindicated and also the disappointment of the fact that I'm vindicated by by a, a piece of base behaviour. Mm -hmm. And um, another lesson I learned is that do not. Be careful when you read critics who analyze your performance because somebody analyzed that scream in a particular way, which had never occurred to me. And the next night I did it like the critic told me to do. It. But you also found yeah, found in that part a real relish of language. Yeah. Well, as I say, he was it's it's genuinely funny, it's genuinely brilliant. Those those choric moments of of, um, of his analysis of the situation are genuinely dazzling. He's a great, great list maker. He does lots of lists. Um, and there was a great teacher in Stratford called John Barton, a great academic, um, who used to talk about lists. And I remember clocking his comments about lists, the sheer relish of... of the list of animals, the list of diseases that he he curses Patroclus with. He's uh he he likes the sound of his own voice. So I mean he he will just yeah <clears throat> spin it around his victims. Um, and I want to draw everybody's attention to that finger. We're going to come back to that finger, yeah, but things. yes, we are um, uh, uh, because there's uh, there's uh, uh, along with having a lot of attention to uh, language and writing, you also have a phenomenal use of the body, particularly those gobstopper eyes that people <laughs> talk about. Um, but I just wanted to make a connection then between this Puritan clown. Um, commentator uh, and this one. Oh, it's interesting. 
Uh, and this finger. is another the first finger. The first finger, by the way, in the sightings was covered in a latex glove. Uh, uh, quite a lot of things that happen on stage, as uh, the actors here will know, happens by chance. And I, I, I knew I had. To, I wanted disease, to have a disease. Um, <laughs> You know, the one to go to for choice usually is syphilis, of course, but um, uh, and I've done many of them. In fact, one literally last week. Um, and the, so I needed some sort of um, makeup on my hands. Tell about makeup on your hands is, of course, it comes off. And uh, so I thought, what should I do about this? And I remembered a boy at school who had uh, some sort of eczema and he used to, Sounds like the Victorian period, which well, was the Victorian period, but I think, I think he soaked his, his feet in iodine. So they were vaguely purple, as I remember. But then in order not to stain the sheets, he used to put plastic bags over his feet. And uh, I thought, oh, hang on. So I put, um, I got some surgical gloves, which I accidentally put off those in the back on the wrong way around. <laughs> when I first did it. So the thumb went like that and the, and the little finger went like that. So they were shaped like that. And I thought, got it. I could keep that. So that particular thing they come um, This is another Sam Mendes production. This is a late uh, Sam Mendes And a, um, there's a continuity, there's a, a movement across your collaboration with Sam that I wanted to, to give you an opportunity to, to, to speak about. Um, but um, this is another overwatching scene um, and a particular moment when the Puritan and the family uh, discovers uh, through supposedly a revelation, love. Uh, and this, I think, is also a, a, a theme that follows through your work as the, the unloved or unlovable who discovers love or thinks about love and then has to do something yeah. in enacting that love. Um, but I also wanted to think about this man uh, ultimately as a monster, uh, the overreacher, the overleaper who aspires above his station and in doing so, potentially as Count Malvolio, um, would 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 uh, create a, a a destruction of a household. Yeah. Um, Sam will kill me, but I wasn't very happy with my performance in this. I mean, I I, I enjoyed him enormously. Um, I and I'll get, we'll get onto the bits that I enjoyed. Um, but. A lot of actors say this about a lot of characters. Gertrude's one, uh, Lady Macbeth's another. Um, it, it feels as if there's a missing beat in Malvolio, and uh, one assumes that's deliberate. But between the moment when he has his ridiculous scene when he's seducing uh, Olivia, and then his next scene in the cell. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a moment when I want him to be caught. Uh, I, I want that moment when he suddenly, the world comes crashing down on him and then we next see him in a cell. It's like uh, you've been not given the chance to do that big, big shift. And it's quite interesting about scenes that you think are missing. I, the, um, in Hamlet, he disappears, doesn't he, Hamlet, for a long period at the beginning of uh, at, at five when he's in England and then comes back a different person, I think. And I've always thought, isn't that interesting that, that we didn't see that change? Um, we'll get on to Hamlet later. But, the, but in other words, I think that seems to be a brilliant choice that possibly the most major change that happens to Hamlet's mind and st state of mind mm -hmm. happens off stage. Um, because he's a, he is a different man when he comes back. Malvolio, I just think, forgive me, I think he missed a trick of, of allowing Malvolio to be seen to be humiliated at the moment of humiliation. Anyway, 
The other thing I had was um, the academics here. I, I, I've always wanted to, I'm sure I'm not the first person who's thought this. I don't believe that he would appear in front of Olivia looking like an idiot and behaving like an idiot. Mm -hmm. he, he's not stupid, Malvoli. He might be pompous. He might be um, <clears throat> self-righteous, but he's not stupid. And I didn't, I didn't believe, forgive me, Sam, I didn't believe what I was trying to do in being sexy to Olivia. And it suddenly occurred to me, I, I read um, something, there's probably no academic support for this at all, but I read somewhere that clothes in the Elizabethan period, in the Elizabethan court, got less and less colourful as the rain went on. And by the time James came in, this is probably absolute nonsense. It was a very interesting idea. By the time James came in and eventually Charles, men tended to wear dark colours. Actually, I know that's wrong. But anyway, it's, it's, mm. I've seen the portraits. But I, I like the idea that somehow they got more and more, men got less and less peacocky and more and more elegant. And then I read, this is linking very bad ideas altogether. I then read about... Um, uh, some old courtier um, in Elizabeth's time who wore, uh, th th he might be one of the sources from Arbella, he wore yellow stockings. In other words, from the perspective of when Twelfth Night was written in the early 17th century, yellow stockings could be old fashioned. And I suddenly thought, and Mariah keeps on going, she doesn't mm -hmm. like yellow. Mm -hmm. Olivia doesn't like yellow. And I suddenly thought, perhaps he dresses up, it's like me dressing up in plus fours. Mm -hmm. It's not ridiculous, it's just a bit odd. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Waistcoat, plus fours, socks, proper golfing shoes, I don't know. What I'm leading up to is, I wonder whether she sees somebody trying to seduce her who looks like her father. <laughs> and that is both borderline, borderline unpleasant, uh, really not very nice for her, and less about him being, hello, I'm sexy. It's more about, hi, I'm secure, I smile, I'm here to help you, I will look after you, and I look like your dad. <laughs> I don't know, it was, so uh, that was something did that you enjoy like, did you enjoy the writing around Malvolio did you enjoy I love that the letter scene's great the letter scene's great um because there's, there's there's a there's a lot of prose in there mm, you yeah. you spent a there's yeah, spent 95 percent uh, and there were the, uh, the, the the bit that I really loved were things like as you say the idea of um his, his then we set the the letter scene uh Sam's idea was to set it in um Malvolio's bedroom. But of course, that gives a whole host of, of uh, indicators you can supply about who Malvolio is. It's his private space. I want the sort of single bed that you get at a, a, an English private school. I wanted a dressing gown when he comes and interrupts the party. Uh, I wanted a dressing gown that was a sort that I was bought when I was a child, which is grey that horrible, slightly itchy, grey, woolly. The men in the audience of a certain age will know what I mean. And this sort of cord uh, thing. And that's when I added a, a hairnet, which made me laugh, that he sleeps in a hairnet. And things like that. I remember the first time he devised the idea of the bedroom, uh, me and Sam, in a, in a hotel not far from here. And after the meeting, I walked around, and I suddenly rushed back, and I said, he should have a private vice. There should be something under the pillow. And um, it can't be alcohol because Toby has got that covered. <laughs> uh, pornography, pornographic magazine, which I like the idea, but Sam wasn't having that. In the end, it was mint humbugs. Do you have them in little hard mint sweets that we have in England, which had a little packet of. And so he'd go, he'd go at the end of a day's work, he'd go home. For a single bed, put on his grey flannel dressing gown and uh, woolen dressing gown, and eat 
humbugs. Now that does more that that does more to me than. So this 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 man who was the Puritan pressure inside the household, the one who was going to be the killjoy, uh, who then has this fantasy about bedding yes. Olivia. Yes, yes. Is he a dangerous man? Yes, I think he probably is. I mean, by the end, I think I'll be revenged upon the whole pack of you. I think I think he sells the story to the tabloids, isn't it? I mean, I think he he makes sure that they suffer as much as he possibly can. I don't think he's uh, yeah. What's he going to lose? Because it this is another Sam Mendes production where you are definitely dangerous, uh, and also um, playing between uh, the clown, the comedic. Um, and the homicidal, yeah. Uh, and uh, another another performance. It seems to me where the the, the genius of 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 of, uh, of this collaboration, and with all, another, this is another extraordinary company brought together. Uh, but the genius of this is the way um, the provocative and the anarchic, the grotesque, was mapped onto. Let's say that the the, the pictures that you can see of the the little boys there holding the balloons while Uncle Gloucester sits lovingly beside them. That that sense, yes. The... You know, I just remember the particular line which made me laugh in that, in that scene. The um, this is the second show I did with Sam, and um, uh, uh, oddly, I, I, a lot of the parts I've done, I've done at the wrong age. Uh, so I was an ancient Benedict, and I was uh, I was quite a young Richard. Uh, things like the, obviously, obviously, I think probably I do use physical, as all, all actors do. I think the physical um, stimulus, and um, <clears throat> I knew I wanted to look as if I'd fought a lot of battles, but not for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to look like an American footballer who's gone to sea. So. Just the the muscle mass had sort of gone, which which makes him frog like, which is described uh, perhaps. Um, the uh, the the uh, kid scene. This is another smelling thing. I. It's interesting when you sort of pack all these memories together, and realize how much you do, as I say. Uh, um, by chance, there's a very famous um, uh, soap opera called Coronation Street in England, and I was I don't watch it, but I I caught the end of a particular episode where one of the characters had actually really died. One of the actors had actually died, so they had to construct a story about his death for the for the soap opera, and in honour of him. They didn't have the theme music at the end as the credits went up. Instead, they had the woman playing his wife opening up a brown paper package with the effects that he had sent back from hospital glasses, a glass case. And it was a very be beautiful scene, you know, unpacking the memories of her husband. And I, I knit that for quite ruthlessly. Um, or the death of the princes. So when the, the murder in Richard III came on, uh, he says to the, the king, I've killed, I've killed the princes. Um, and he hands him a packet. And in the packet, I undid the packet, and out came pyjamas, little tiny pyjamas, which I then smelt. And of course, they smell like babies do. You know, one of the most beautiful smells in the world is this sort of clean, mm -hmm. bathed skin and talc. And, <laughs> and that's what I had in my head that I was smelling these, the smell of innocence, really. Right away, so there's a curious, constant, you know, juxtaposition or, 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 um, uh, not necessarily not synthesizing, but yeah, keeping them quite separate, but that they're in the same space of the, the monster. 
and this sweetness. Yeah, it's yes, very the, rare. The, we'll again come on to that. But there's a very rare case, very rare occasion when there isn't a little bit of a twist mm -hmm. somewhere, mm -hmm. isn't there? Of of you know what was what was Richard thinking then? He can't afford. He, he's bordering on regret, but can't afford that. Okay, um, oh, I so. want to come come back to another package in this. But can you remember how it was that you encountered the opening lines of this play? that everybody knows and everybody in the theater must either be kind of mouthing them with you, um, coming at them fresh, new, your way, as opposed to inheriting all of those versions that have gone before. Now is the winter. Oh, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the first thing to get rid of the, the, that, that timbre. Mm -hmm. um, I... I wonder whether I've deliberately ignored. This applies, of, of course, most um, most obviously in Hamlet. But try to avoid worrying about the famous line. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I there's nothing you can do with a line like that that will. Now, what am, I, what am I going to try and say? I'd like to say that doesn't open up a new universe, but in fact, actually, I do think that you can open up a new universe, as it were. But uh, don't, don't, don't push it. Don't push it. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit tough to because believe it. I know, I know that sounds okay. so simple, but if you try and do to be or not to be, just try, try, try and strip away. Try and strip away. Well, half half these parts we're discussing now have been played by the greatest actors in history. There's nothing you can do about that. <laughs> um, so forget it. I, I do remember on the very first day of re rehearsals for Hamlet, John Gielgud died. And I remember thinking, God, that's... Um, you know, arguably the greatest Hamlet of the 20th century. On the day I start my journey, mm -hmm. um, I, I hope I'm not angry enough to think that the spirit of John Gill <laughs> flew into me. But, um, but I, I, I was aware that there was a significance in it, but probably the significance was in you just have to, have to just push that aside. And the other thing, and I've talked to you about this a lot, about <clears throat> with these very great parts, <clears throat> uh, and I've batted on about this many times, is trying to get rid of the pre preconceptions of the part. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's no point in going, now is the winter of our discontent, with a memory of Olivier and also memory of Olivier's perception of the part. It's just impossible. And in fact, I was, in fact, doing Richard after a very, very great recent Richard in Stratford, which was Tony Scher's um, Spider. Um, and, you know, I, I, and Ian McKellen, I think, was doing it at the same time in, in, um, in London. So I, 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 you just have to somehow get rid of the preconceptions, both of this, of its history and also one's preconceptions that have been developed through reading about that history or hearing about that history. Mm -hmm. um, you see, the thing, the... the, the in the second half of Richard, he has two scenes with queens. Um, the first one, the famous one, where he stews his queen or lady Anne at that stage over the coffin of her father-in-law and does it. Amazing. <laughs> and it marvelous, challenges the audience to a sort of, uh, you think I can't do this? I can do it. And at the end of the scene going, mm -hmm. uh, and the second greater scene, I think, uh, well, I think Olivia cut in the film, but the scene with Elizabeth, which is where he thinks he can still do it and he can't. And in the back of his head, he knows, he knows he can't do it anymore. He can't do that flirty, seductive, sexy thing anymore. And she knows that he knows that he knows she, you know, she can see he's, 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 and the interesting thing about that scene is that he, he, oddly enough, is more genuine with the second scene than in the first scene. Because in the second scene, he's saying, 
there is no answer to this civil mm. war. There is no answer to this carnage unless I can marry your daughter. That's the only way we can get around this. And it's genuine. He really, 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 the, you know, the, there's a great set of series of lines. It cannot, that's right, he talks about the horrors. It cannot be avoided but by this. It will not be avoided but by this. And he really means it. Uh, and nothing he said to lay down the first scene he ever meant, and yet he succeeded in the first scene, and he fails in the second. Mm -hmm. But it's also right um, in thinking that you found something in this in the writing that was about your father. Oh, did I? Yes, you said you said that that your Richard um, kept seeing, kept referring, thinking about his father. Because his father was the one who loved him. Yes. His mother okay. cursed him. I thought you meant my father. No, 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 not um, your father. His father. Although, no, that father. Although actually, I've got an, I've got, I've got something to say about a, a, a Terry Hans note, but that's later. Yes. There's one scene with Richard and his mother. <laughs> she obviously can't bear the sight of him, and. The way we played it is that has been so since his birth. So his reaction is that awful long-term weariness with being insulted by his mother. Um, it doesn't require a reaction, really. It's just that she, she'll do her usual cursing and then she'll be off and I can forget about her. But the but Dad, Dad, the Duke of York... He loved me. He loved me despite the fact that everyone else regarded me as a physical uh, disaster and not being able to fight. Um, he really loved me. Mm -hmm. I think most Richards who've done Henry the Sixth, I think, find that is that those three boys. There is some. There is something special about Richard, and and his dad recognised that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think that's the man he. Yeah. But there's a thread I see thematically coming through here of the love story yeah. that is underneath these stories of horror and monstrosity and and uh, um, uh, uh, and the grotesque yeah, yeah, that yeah. In, and you played him very much as a grotesque body, but you also did things that were utterly surprising to the to the audience. Um, you had that little that little um, uh, uh, stick that Charlie you tapped, yeah the got, top you, you home, tap yeah. tap tap. You always heard Richard coming down the corridor. Tap 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 tap, uh, and it was when in in your hand. Uh, when the head of Hastings was brought to you in a beautifully tied up brown paper parcel with string. And then what did you do? Um, yes, I <laughs> rammed my stick, as you can see, into a what was it, a cabbage inside that box. It was a very satisfying moment. Um, I can take no credit for that. Um, that was uh, that was Sam's idea. <clears throat> the... Um, Tapping, however, his, every entrance proceeded with a tap. And I really, really, I don't think, I, we might have done it, or, or perhaps it was just a private joke, or perhaps it was a sound effect that people couldn't hear. But of course, in the first speech, which he goes, um, dogs bark at me as I pass by them. So I wanted every entrance to have the sound of barking. <laughs> everywhere he goes, everywhere he goes, these Two fucking dog barking at me. Um, oh, the other thing I remember, as you reminded me, the other thing I remember, and I think I talked to Stanley about this years and years ago in uh, in the Shakespeare Institute in, in Stratford, because I think there's a French production that's based a whole production on this, eating for Richard. I think almost every other scene he eats, or he's just about to go off to dinner. So I'll meet you at dinner. Um, <laughs> Uh, anyway, food blooms large, and of course the famous strawberries. I really admire your strawberries, Bishop Ely. Uh, and I'll go, go and get you some there. And, that, and he comes with the strawberries. Um, and then the night before the Battle of Bosworth, he goes, "I'm not hungry." Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, all his men go, "Uh oh, <laughs> he's not eating." And I think there was a French production down in uh, south of France, which entirely based on the idea that he spent whole time eating and then stopped. Oh, well, that's a nice segue into yeah. this man. 
So um, I, 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 I sneaked this one in because it just alludes to uh, the vast uh, experience and repertoire that you have on film. Um, uh, and here playing comic monster Puritan um, of sorts, um, who is called. I just watched this. I, I watched the. What did you think? Ago. Is it okay? <laughs> there are moments when I go, oh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> I think, well, if, if I can't understand it, <laughs> nobody else is going to. Um, this goodly portly man the, the, who's going to be, you the, know, who's going to be the mentor of the of the prince and the, teach him how to be oh, a oh, king. Oh, and <laughs> there are a couple of nice moments. The the um, uh, but actually the film is rather sweet. Um, interesting about soliloquy. We will talk about soliloquy if you want later. But soliloquy on film, interesting one, isn't it? Because actually, I, I watched um, Falstaff do the honor speech, thinking. Yeah, it's not an internal monologue, is it? Somehow, that's How, this. Is this this? That, that's it. That's that, the the honor speech. Honor speech must be around there, isn't it? Yeah, you were there. You know. yeah, but, <laughs> yeah. but it's a funny one because I um, years and years ago, the late great Roger Michel, director, uh, said when you do a soliloquy, you have to cast the audience in a, as a character or at least as a function in relation to you. Um, and I think he's, I think he said, I got that from somebody else, but uh, so he's, he took no credit for it. But of course, it's that's the uh, God said about how you do, the choices you have as a soliloquizer. Um, and interesting, I think the honest speech needs the complicity of an audience. I think he, he has to assume um, a bit like, uh, he has to assume the audience, a bit like Richard, that, the audience will agree with him. He's a sort mm -hmm. of leader of a gang, isn't he, false stuff? I think Richard is a sort of leader of a gang. He'll just go, as I say, he'll go to the audience, you think I can't seduce this woman over the corpse of the man I've murdered? You're wrong, I can. Mm -hmm. And then he goes at the end, see, it's a sort of leader of a gang mentality. And I think false stuff has that. And it's interesting, the, the, uh, that Hamlet, Hamlet's only friends are the audience, really. Um, for all his respect for Horatio, for all Horatio's probable love for Hamlet, his real friends are the audience. The, the relationship with Horatio is quite, quite distant, polite. Um, with Iago, this idea that I've seen written up somewhere else, but which I thought foolishly that I'd invented, but I... Well, there's a new idea because there are no, no new ideas that Iago lies to the audience in soliloquy um, which other actors have disagreed with me about this one but uh, the uh, Iago I played lies to the audience quite blatantly and goes you can believe me if you will if you don't don't care Irrelevant what you think, relevant how you judge me. I'm telling you, and my God, we've seen this in the world, haven't we? I'm telling you that Othello slept with my wife. And I'm absolutely sure that as Iago says, he knows that's not true. But I challenge you, audience, to challenge me. No, you can't. Well, uh, Hamlet famously stops soliloquizing, which is also an interesting moment that he, when he becomes sort of, um, he comes back from England, he stops soliloquizing because something in his soul no longer needs us. Um, and the only one I thought was in almost entirely, and that is not one of my um, proudest performances, um, Macbeth is the only one that I found was so internalized. Mm -hmm. I think you can do those ones as a as a as an internal monologue, mm -hmm. but this one I think I I found the honest speech, um, but he's a shit. <laughs> That's why I, I mean I lo I I I love I love that he's really awful. Man. You wouldn't want to spend any time with him. Um, he oh, likes himself though. He, he likes his enjoys his own company. But God, we've known people. We've all known people like, that I have. 
you know, yeah, in the pub for an hour, we're just about a bit of a, but honestly, really, no. And, but he's dying. I think that's the important thing about both Henry and Falstaff, is they're dying for most of those two plays. Certainly in the second play, they're, 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 whether they know it or not, they're on their way out. And that that has a sort of whole different tone, I think, to, to his behaviour. But he's, oh, he's a terrible man. Dangerous? But, Yes, I mean, uh, not lovable. Dangerous, not dangerous like Richard III. Not dangerous mm-hmm. like Iago. He's he's more annoying. <laughs> I think. <laughs> oh, would you stop nicking biros from the office? You know, it just oh, stop it. <laughs> Where did that cake go that we brought? <laughs> just stop it. And uh, it's it's sort of the, the other thing I love. You know the um, the famous, which you'll all know here, that famous crux in Henry the Fourth about babbling of green fields, you know, the yeah. mm-hmm. was it Tybalt, was it, who inserted that uh, as an idea. Uh, and what I love about babbling of green fields is you know, false, for those who don't know, Falstaff is dying and according to Mrs. Crickley he's babbling of green fields. It's a brilliant uh, emendation of a, a line that doesn't make any sense in the original authoritative text. Um, but what I love about the fact that if he's babbling of green fields, Falstaff, he's babbling with loathing for green fields. I mean, I think <laughs> he can't bear the country. <laughs> and I love this this idea that's again get rid of preconceptions because I had a preconception of Falstaff as somehow representative of an anarchic England, which included grass. <laughs> <laughs> There's no grass in Falstaff's world. <laughs> He's sent out the country, he can't bear it, he can't bear the people he has to get into his little gang of soldiers. Shallow bores him to death about apples. Oh, oh, <laughs> just get me back. Get me back to the pub. <laughs> uh, so now you are um, looking at... Um, Couple of places where you know we we you, uh, um, Boyka talked originally about you 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 uh, announcing yourself by a voice this extraordinary voice that could do so many extraordinary things from going high to that shriek down to the low it was a serious pleasing of a lute <laughs> yes. uh huh um, but the in in the first time you played um, in uh, in uh, uh, King Lear. You were cast in a part as Edgar, uh, where your body shape did not immediately seem to lend itself yeah. to that part. No. And the same thing happened when Cassius. you were cast as Cassius. Um, and in both times, you discovered things in these parts that people had never seen before. So um, uh, talk us the, through. Um, well, I mentioned before that the, the first offer was uh, The Fool. And I didn't think I was technically capable of doing the full. Um, and Adrian, the director of Lear, said, um, with the great Robert Stevens, um, said, uh, is there another part you're interested in? And I said, well, Edgar. And they, I've since seen a brilliant Edgar years ago, something called Paul Rees. Mm. Um, and I... I know what I wanted to do with Edgar, but I don't think I did it, to be honest. Um, uh, it's a very, very strange part. And it's a very strange part to find the, the base note, the core, the, the, man, the man from whom the rest of the, of the story develops, because, of course, you never really see it um, before he turns into a fugitive and then uh, pretending to be um, mad. Um, the uh, Yeah, the idea of me representing somebody starving, as you can see, <laughs> was um, a little bit tricky. What about uh, uh, what about having to represent the lean and hungry lean Cassius? And hungry Cass- I want to say about the, the person who was in charge of, of uh, movement mm-hmm. uh, on the first day of rehearsal said, I'm thinking... For the mad scenes, um, El Greco. El Greco? <laughs> They're seven feet tall and 
Dinner's reeds are yellow, <laughs> or red and green. I mean, is it broidal? Is it something we can do? On the... That's why I'm stretching up because I'm trying to make myself into a real thing. Um, but with yes, Cassius. Cassius, uh, Cassius is very interesting because again, that was wasn't well. Well, Edgar was sort of my choice, but um, uh, Cassius wasn't my idea. And Deborah Warner, who is directing this amazing production, actually hundreds of people in it, which we toured around Europe. We did in Luxembourg, where I suspect most of the population of Luxembourg <laughs> on, the, on, the, on the stage. Um, and she said, I want you to do Cassius. And I went, oh. Um, I would have thought, uh, you might have thought, thought of me with the other one. She said, no, I think, I think your, your psychological interests lean towards the Cassius rather than the Brutus. Mm. And of course, actually, he's the most amazing character. Mm. Um, and I said, I have a problem about lean and hungry, obviously. Uh, and in fact, we had a change of cast very early on in rehearsal. Somebody dropped out and Anton Less, um, we placed Cass, uh, Brutus with Anton Lesser. And I remember before Anton Lester agreed to do it, do it, I said to her, look, I, I just want you to just, can you take this opportunity to just think again about whether you would be embarrassed about me doing Cassius? Because, you know, uh, she said, well, she was great about it. She said, well, I'll go away and think about it. And then she came back and said, no, I think, I think I've put you in the right one of the two, as it were. And, um, uh, and I said, well, as long as people don't laugh at me. And she said, I promise, I promise you, they won't laugh at me. And they didn't. Mm -mm. So I, I take no credit for that at all. Stop, it wasn't even really mentioned in the press. So I don't know how she deflected it, but she, because the, the line was in. I mean, he said... Um, and the line became about a, a, a metaphorical lean and hungry look rather than a literal lean and hungry look. Anyway, um, but he, he was a fascinating man. I mean, a bit like Iago, he, I imagined him as having a slight difficulty with class. But in, this is not historically true, but I, my Cassius was definitely not aristocratic like Brutus was. Brutus was from very top drawer. Mm. And um, uh, Cassius, very bright, uh, but not not socially that the gratin. Uh, so uh, there was that to play with. There was also the, 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 and I've mentioned this before, but he mentions committing suicide, I think, almost in every scene. I think. Pretty consistent thing he's got. I'll kill myself. If, if this, if Caesar's king, I will kill myself. And I thought, is this hysterical? Is this sort of theatrical? Or is it absolutely genuine? And I thought, what, what, what have you played absolutely genuinely? I, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not joking. I cannot live under a, autocratic ruler. I can't. I simply can't. It's not worth living. And of course, the end of what's so sad is at the end, of course, he does, well, he, he asks somebody to assist him in, in killing himself. So that he was a genuine, not, not a manipulator, particularly, not uh, enormously clever at plotting, uh, but a genuinely genuinely politically engaged man who could not see a way out except for murder. The interesting thing I think about the, the you know, if everyone, all, you know, all the talk about, you know, plotting and cleverness and it's a bit like my opinion about Iago. They completely botch the murder, don't they? I mean, the first thing they do is just, I suspect like a lot of those things are chaos, you know, mm -hmm. the wrong person speaks, the He's interrupted on the way to the thing. He almost doesn't go. All those sort of things, all the improvisatory things that you 
have to play with mean that um, that you know, however good a plotter you are, eventually you're going to be taken over by events. But I remember you playing that scene genuinely, this, the first Brutus um, uh, exchange. Uh, I do observe you now uh, as a as a seduction scene of a, a man who's had such respect for Brutus, such... Well, that, that's, I think, why I mentioned the class thing. He adores Brutus at the beginning. The, my, my, my one, my Cassius did. Because Brutus represents a world that Cassius would like to be part of and knows he can't do. So it's, it's, it's partly a bigger thing than Brutus himself. You know, you, you, you're just, you're clever... You wear the right clothes. You're part of the right clubs, and mm -hmm. and I and I'm a bit of a lump, I'm, but I'm clever. And I think you see that that particular dynamic work a lot in politics. Mm -hmm. I think you see people on the television. Mm -hmm. You can see it in our government at the moment. You know mm -hmm. that there are various sort of class issues going on, especially with Tory governments. That Just in terms of acting, that idea of this double act, this, you know, the, and the mind that's going inside the other mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and showing I mean, himself and a mirror of himself. The, the second, mm. that awful scene of betrayal on both their parts, but particularly on Brutus's, saying, you know, you're, 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 Doing fraudulent financial mm -hmm. deals. What? And Cassius is hurt at being caught, not being as stylish as Brutus politically. Well, <clears throat> yeah. Well, he's this man, one, this man, you <clears throat> you said to me, um, uh, which I found a revelation. Iago is the dullest man in Shakespeare. <laughs> he has this reputation of being this great Machiavelli, this great dancer around with words and and uh, uh, um, uh, and playing all of these different roles and a schemer and so on. You said he is absolutely dull. <laughs> well, I'm showing off a bit, but I, I, uh, <laughs> I still stick to it actually because. Uh, Again, he's not the Machiavel. I didn't see him as the Machiavel that's sort of, you know, it's very important that we see him fail in Venice at the beginning of the play. It's interesting that Verdi, of course, cut that from the opera and sort of somehow made a much more coherent piece of drama in a way. But that first section of Shakespeare's play, when Othello, uh, when Iago, and I don't know what his motive is, whether it's just to mess up irritate Iago, uh, Othello, or whether it's to really damage him. But either way, it doesn't work. You know, he's too minor. He's too, he's too, he's not a big player. He's not, you know, Othello's going to walk into the council and go, and they're going to go, oh, wow, here he is. Uh, the great Othello sent him off with mm -hmm. another commission, uh, which indeed is what happens. Um, he could, he could, seems to me, he can only work in a very small environment, like a, a tiny garrison in Cyprus, he can just about juggle six people. The other thing is, I don't, I don't understand what's so clever about saying to a man, "I think your wife's having an affair." <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, on the level of cleverness, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not <laughs> second theory of relativity. It's just a <laughs> really basic despicable behaviour, which we could all indulge in. And, and, and once he's done that, I mean, of course, well, no, does he know that Othello's going to accept it? I don't know, actually, come to think of it. He's always improvising. He spends the whole time improvising. He just says, oh, watch her. I think your wife's sleeping with somebody else, which I defy any person to not have some moment of reaction to mm -hmm. you know. but you also observed about him that he is a man absolutely without love yeah well the, the, mm. what i was saying about the dull thing is that i think his his language is 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 uh, uh, dull no the word for it it plods along it, it might have a bit of uh, <laughs> 
might have a bit of sort of grammatical place. And, you know, he likes, he likes balanced sentences. He likes a long argument. But actually, when you look at the arguments, you think, um, you know, it's not a fellow. And that seems to be the principal dynamic, one of the, one of the principal dynamics in the play. Uh, yeah, the man who can really do it is a fellow. And that's the man he's pitching against. And what he, what, when I say he's absolutely without love, I think there is something, uh, I don't know where it comes from, but there's a, there's a type of um, lovelessness in him that requires other people to be loveless. And I think the, the centre of the play, when, when he's, he and Othello are completing each other's sentences, which I think ends with the, the epileptic fit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think that's subliminally what Iago would, he gets so excited by that. I made someone into, into the, into the, I made somebody come with me into the loveless universe that I inhabit. Uh, he's, he's just become me. He's as destructive as loveless as me. Yeah, there you go. And there he's on the floor. <laughs> uh, a sweet prince. Yes, um, a revelation that you <clears throat> that you found in this uh, this prince uh, was that you said you found sweetness, um, and the other the other uh, aspect of that I, I, that I've always hung on was the, was the notion of the unpredictable muggings of grief yeah. uh, that they come up behind you and hit you on the head, and that's where your Hamlet was but that you also found something that was about love and sweetness. But let's just ask you to do that. <clears throat> um, I might not do it, but I... I <laughs> it's a very interesting one, this. The, um, uh, my mum died just before Hamlet. So that's why the mugging of grief. And it was sort of dedicated to her, really. Um, and she knew I was going to do it, which is what's so sad. Um, are we all right for time? I, I can sit here and just talk for hours. Are we all right for time? Well, nobody's leaving. All right, well, okay. um, the, uh, and the, 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 fun enough, it was, it was going to be directed by Sam, and then he, he did a little film called American Beauty and seemed to take it. <laughs> uh, and actually he was in the middle of that. The campaigning for all that, and he said, "Look, I, I don't think I can do it." I said, "Absolutely understand. This obviously looks American beauty. Looks like it's going to go, go places." So, um, so John Kerr took over, and it's quite interesting about how the relationship between a director and a piece and you is that if Sam had directed, I don't think I would have come out with such a, a sweet Hamlet. I, I think John was the sort of director who went, "No, let's try him loving his father." He loves his father. He misses his father. And in fact, as you remember the, in the, in the uh, scene with Gertrude, when the ghost of my father comes into the bedroom for a split second, I had my wish back. I had dad back. I had mum back. And uh, there they were. And then he goes. And... Um, so that type of, of, and there were bits of mum that I put in, you know, um, uh, her dehydrated tongue, I remember, uh, on uh, Remember Me, Remember Me, um, which was the last time I saw it. She, um, my father tried to get her to stick her tongue out to see how dehydrated she was. And he managed to do that. So there were little sort of uh, homages to her. Uh, but uh, but he definitely was <laughs> things like after the play instead of there's a bit where he asks for music and I think probably Shakespeare probably intended to be dancing around going EP um, <laughs> I just went well what do you do now <laughs> what do you do now I've got final proof but 
my uncle killed my father. Can we have some music while I think about it? So these three recorders came on, played rather mournfully, <laughs> all the way through the interval. With Hamlet going, I don't, I just don't know what to do with this. I really don't know what to do. Because he always had an escape route about the this could be the devil, couldn't it? Anyway, this speech, um I always use the the first line when I'm talking to uh, people about uh stress and all that stuff. <coughs> Verse. Because I mark up all my scripts. Uh uh, because I think, uh, not because I'm a particular Puritan about this, I just think that in the end, it gives you a solid, solid base from which to then do what you want. If you if you learn it so that it's secure, and that first sign is a very interesting one because of course you've got the option of going, oh that this too too solid flesh would melt, which is fine, or you can reverse it and go, oh that this too too solid flesh would melt. And just when you made that decision, it, when when uh, the little teaching I've done, um, and I did the first, if you secure it, then you know that you're not going to be going, oh, this too, too, that somehow the structure of your voice will fall away and you'll end up not quite knowing where you are. And the interesting thing about, oh, that this too, too, sort of flesh and melt is that, oh, is a much underrated word. Okay. It's a very difficult one to not be embarrassed by, but my God, if you're given it, use it. You know, oh, this too, too solid. I mean, absolutely. And the other thing is the first soliloquy. Uh, and I've talked already about how you deal with audiences and soliloquy, but this is the first time he talks to his friends. And from but two months dead, and they're not so much, not too, so excellent king down to. She married. So what's that? Fifteen lines. Yeah, it's a single sentence, isn't it? The poor boy doesn't know where he is. And not only is it a single sentence, it's it's interrupted all the time. He can't he can't <laughs> he can't locate what the problem is really. Uh, I mean, she married. Bam comes in like a, a punch, and and that is the ostensible problem. But you sense that there's a sort of whirring of, I don't, I just don't know what to, I don't know how to react to this situation. Uh, and the, uh, uh, what he does also beautifully is to locate small details. My favourite being the shoes. I think that's just a masterstroke. The shoes she wore at the wedding were the same as the, the, mm -hmm. were the, the, well I assume they were the same shoes yeah uh, isn't it like all uh, yeah, like, uh, where is it or are those shoes rolled with which he followed my poor father's body and I just had this image of him sitting in church he didn't attend the marriage but he was sitting in church while they got married and just looking in the aisle and just seeing these shoes thinking oh my god she wore those at dad's funeral Anyway, so it's locating those tiny little individual, um, absolutely uh, direct emotional impact, and the and the, as I say, he doesn't he doesn't know why he feels so bad. But that's what's so wonderful about that speech. Well, here's another man who thinks through soliloquy, and in with a particularity of speech that seems to me to release um, our imaginations into territories that are um, you know, of metaphor, of a, of a discourse, uh, that if it were painted, only Bruegel could paint it. Well, well who's the other one? Bosch. Uh, the other one. Yeah, this is one that I, I disappointed myself in, but I do have very, very strong and passionate feelings about this play. And I I I suspect it was because I had such passionate and strong feelings about this play that I didn't quite bring it off. But I I um I the 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 thing that you mentioned the the 
that extraordinary image. Uh, when tis done, if it were done when tis done, then to well it were done quickly. Uh, his first soliloquy again is a man that we barely heard speak. Fascinating that, isn't it? You look at the first scenes of the play, he doesn't really speak. I mean, uh, his wife does a lot of speaking, and, but he doesn't really speak. He's just not one of those guys, you know. And then in that soliloquy, that is the naked newborn babe soliloquy, mm -hmm. isn't it, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Out comes this image, which I simply cannot locate as an image. It's so grotesque. A huge baby mm -hmm. striding across the sky. Is that what is, is that the image? Very big legs. There's a baby in... Um, uh, 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 Toy Story 3 is uh, it's that baby, isn't it? <laughs> the monster baby striding the blast. I don't know, I, I, it's, it's with the and trumpets and tears falling back from your eyes onto your face. I mean, it's a, it's a nightmare, isn't it? And, mm. I, and I think the reason why I mention that is that there's something that is released in Macbeth by the prospect of, of this murder, which takes him by surprise and takes her by surprise too. And she does say to him, I don't understand you anymore. And he says, don't worry about it. And he goes off off on on um, uh, a spinning, poetic journey, um, you know, caused by, you know, stimulated by this murder. So I think it's, um, and he also, we know it's about children somehow, that play. We just know it's about children. That's why the naked newborn babe is such an odd, odd. It's about a dead child. It's about, uh, you mentioned um, going to watch the murder of the Maduff children. It's about witnessing or knowing about the murder of children in your kingdom. In my case, wanting to go and watch a child being murdered. It's about getting rid of all the, all the children in Scotland somehow, mm -hmm. and ending up in a in a permanent present somehow. So that you can be king. So that you can stay still, stay still, and be king forever. Because I can't look back, I can't look forward. I am just king. And tomorrow and tomorrow. And tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow. I just don't, I don't mean. I'm going to fast forward you across. Yes, there are three times in your career that you've played a role twice. So the Young Shepherd and then the play twice. A play twice, yeah. Um, Lear, twice. Oh, Tempest. And then The Tempest. Why don't you say something then about... Uh, air, air, let's do Air and te um, Tempest first. Um, my uh, the interesting thing about my Errol, who seems who was absolutely imperious, <laughs> um, he's the one in the blue suit at the top. Just did everything he was told, completely glacial. Uh, Caliban was just shooting his mouth off about how unhappy he was. Ariel in the same situation. And then, and again, it's not my idea, at the end of the production, at the, the evening, Prospero releases Ariel and Ariel spat in his face. Um, it was the only time I've been heckled in the Shakespeare. Rubbish! Um, that, uh, uh, and in fact, we eventually cut it, not, not actually because of, I think the Sunday Times described it as a catastrophic decision. Um, but uh, I, I loved it. I thought it was very interesting, and I and I and I did think that in fact, actually, Caliban and Ariel think exactly the same thing. It's just that Ariel is prepared to play along until such time as as he's released, and uh, uh, and I loved it. We cut it not because of 
critical reaction because it just became it felt a bit vulgar in later and it was the way I was playing it it became an effect and actually I thought the spit rather than did the spit and uh, when I did Prospero I wanted my aerial to love me (laughs) (laughs) it was quite an interesting little lesson I wonder what my Prospero who's called Alan McCann great actor he probably sat there going, oh, just, just love me for a bit. I mean, just you know, stop looking at me like this. <laughs> um, like it's a dirty, horrible smell. Um, uh, yes, I, uh, my area loved me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you found it very hard to let him go. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. But he also challenged you, didn't he? When when uh, when he when you asked him about where all of the all of the separated uh, uh, people were, and he distributed them around the island, um, and the good old Gonzalo, uh, the tears run down his face like winter's drops down eaves of reeds, and you then said to him, "What did I say to him? You, um, does I think so? Does I think so?" Uh, um, your, yes. That your your affections would grow tender. Yes, uh, 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 mine would. It leads up to um, mine would. Mine would were yes. I human, which is one of the the, the great shakes. It's like oceans oh, warm in winter's tale, touching the statue. It's one of the great moments, isn't it? When Ariel says to his human master, "You know something, you can do better than that," and uh, and you could forgive if you were human. But of course, what's so awful about the play? And the same sort of thing with Lear. It's, uh, it, you know, the last lines of Prospero of the whole play is set me free. Mm-hmm. And you think, as an actor playing that, you sit there thinking that's partly Prospero going, I've just done this stop, this circular desire for revenge, for um, that awful feeling of of the superiority of forgiveness. I forgive you. And his brother going, I don't care whether you forgive me or not, actually. Mm-hmm. And that's the, the de ho on bar feel of, I forgive you. you know, that, but uh, but uh, I remember, the, the, I remember when, he, when you said to him, um, uh, he, he said to you, mine would, sir, were I human, that you didn't immediately answer, and I shall. Yeah. You looked at him and you shrieked. Shriek, yeah. It was that Thersite scream that was now which, which actually changed, voiced. Which, which changed, which changed, which changed, but yeah. you found it really yeah, yeah. Oh, really I found hard. it impossibly difficult. To forgive. To forgive. Oh, God, yes. The last thing I want, the, what that prospect wants to do. But it's interesting, the, the, that thing when you suddenly... Just one final thing about Lear. Um, I went with a, a marvellous academic called Sonia Masai to... I was doing a TV program about Shakespeare editing. By the way, <laughs> that's my first example of proper Shakespeare editing. Copies over there. But it was of King Lear, actually. And she was showing me the differences between the two ends of King Lear. And uh, uh, the one version has King Lear, before he dies, um, doing, I think, a fairly conventional line. Uh, heart, I pretty break, is it, I think. Mm-hmm. I'm looking at all you academics, I think I think it's hard, I pretty big. Which he then gave to Kent. And then the other version, which of course was the one that's usually done because it's just, it is more interesting, has uh his last lines look there, look there. And I, I, I Sonia and I were looking at it, this the, the versions we had in front of us at the museum. And we were talking about how this the second version has the possibility of What's he do? What's look here, look here mean? Is it a vision? Is you see her breathing? Is it a sign of hope? Is it um, is it something good? And I went away that night and I thought, not necessarily. <laughs> it's not necessarily good. Look there, look there. Depends how you say look there, look there. And that night. I did a bit like the Shriek in the Tempest. It was look, look, at the, look at the corpse of my child. Mm-hmm. Just look. So it wasn't about that, which is which is absolutely really that absolutely valid thing. But it was so exciting to go. 
well, why not switch around? And um, because the, the Lear, Lear is the most profoundly disappointed play, isn't it? I mean, the, that great scene when when he's ill and she comes back to him and he says, "I'm bound upon a wheel of fire," and that marvelous moment at the end of that scene, which is, "Should we go for a walk?" Yes, that's what you do with your ill dad. And and you think, oh, they're on their way. They're on their way to forgiving each other. And then she's dead. It's just the most profoundly disappointed play. Anyway. I just want to leave you oh, with love. Benedict and love. The that's man that love. you say is the bravest, the bravest man, in man in Shakespeare. I'm always um, coming up with sentences like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But the, the Benedict you played was just full of love. Yeah. And then just two comments. Um, uh, John Peter on actors. Actors are ambassadors from playwrights to his audience, but part of the message they bring is their own. A performance is a role seen through a temperament, an imaginary person realized through the perceptions and technical skills of a real one. And then you talking about the audience. Each individual audience member determines what is seen and what is understood. The audience operates as a sort of theatrical uncertainty principle upon the generative imprecision of the actor's performance. I want the audience to do their work. Oh, gosh. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. God forbid that I should come between you and these two, but okay. thank you, thank you so much. I do want to make a brief thank you again to Boyka for her endless efforts uh, to make this happen each year. I also want to thank our comms and events team, uh, Joe, Caroline, and Safa, who, who've done a great deal of work and masterfully, I shall say. Um, and then I want to thank all of you. It's a great pleasure to have had you here. You're always welcome here at the London Global Gateway. In the back, as, as Boyka had said, there's an opportunity to contribute to the um, the Ukrainian collection that they're taking up in the back. And then also I'll mention again, uh, Simon's uh, upcoming, well, here it is, his book, which he co-edits. So I'm, I'm grateful that he's brought it and that we'll have an opportunity. We're going to move any questions or conversation that you may have to the reception that will follow immediately. There's an abundance of, of canapes and uh, Beverages overflowing. So I want to thank to our students. There are many students here. I know it's every night's a busy night in London. So we're really grateful for your presence. God bless.